I have a ask the pastor question that I have to admit had never crossed my mind before. And I looked at the question and, and uh, quite honestly, my brain froze. <laughs> it does that sometimes. So the question is, are we supposed to love the devil? Love your enemies. Lucifer is our enemy. Are we supposed to love him? Never entered my brain. <laughs> However, I did come up with an answer. No. <laughs> you want why? Why? Number one. Love your enemies was given by Jesus in his Sermon on the Mount, talking to people about people. It deals with how humans should interact with one another, how God expects us to treat with one another. Okay. Uh, we see in there that it talks about uh, the sin nature of man and how God views sin as not just an action but a thought. Uh, it talks about how um, you know, when, when they would heap their abuses on us, we endure and we trust God. Uh, so when, when the scripture given that we are to love our enemies, um, nowhere in scripture does it give us any emotional connection to any spiritual being except for the triune God. Okay? Angels, demons, archangels, doesn't matter. It never gives us any emotional connection to those creatures. Okay, those creations. Second, so, well, actually, this would be third. First, he's telling us this is how man deals with man. Second, there is no reference anywhere in Scripture as to any emotional connection to heavenly beings other than the triune God. Third, um, the devil, Lucifer, is the antithesis to God. He is God's declared enemy. Um, God has already determined what the devil's future will be. They have, the, the fallen angels have no chance at redemption. Okay? Uh, we don't understand what all happened. Uh, that was done on a heavenly realm that we were not a part of. Uh, but, but when Lucifer fell, he became the devil, he became Satan. He established then what his eternity would be. So we have no emotional connection to him. Uh, as a matter of fact, when uh, the archangel Michael was contesting over the body of Moses, he didn't even bother dealing with the devil. He just said, the Lord rebuke you. He let God's rebuke be sufficient. Okay. Um, so do we love the devil? No, God doesn't love the devil. So we're not expected to love the devil. Okay? I have the, there was no name on this, so I will leave it here. There's a little bit more in depth with uh, scripture cited. So feel free to come and get that after service. Um, four years ago, I preached a message about the election. Today, I am going to preach the same message. So if you can remember in detail what I said four years ago, you're excused. <laughs> you will you be remember? tested. Oh yeah, because I read my notes. <laughs> I want to uh, read a passage here, and this kind of sets the entire context of what I want to say. Uh, Psalm chapter 20, verse 7, says, Some trust in chariots, and some in horses. I want to change that. I'm going to change that to, Some trust in elephants, and some trust in donkeys. Some trust in the political whatever, 
And, and we've seen that those, those are a vain hope because of what follows, okay? So we don't place our trust in the temporal things. We place our trust in, we trust in the name of the Lord our God. Why? Because they collapse and fall, but we rise and stand upright, okay? This election was probably one of the most contentious I've ever seen, one of the filthiest mudslinging events I've ever had the not privilege to witness. And, and I didn't even witness a lot of it because I don't watch TV. So I didn't have to put up with a lot of the ads and a lot of the stuff that was going on. But I will tell you this, okay? Whether your candidate won or whether your candidate lost, okay? Because if your candidate lost, then for the last eight years, you probably had a president that you endorsed, supported. If your candidate won, then for the last eight years, you probably did not have a president that you endorsed and probably didn't support. I want to talk about a couple of things that put this whole picture into a correct God view. Okay, so um, turn with me to Romans chapter 13, if you would. Romans chapter 13, verse 1. Let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. Now, I want to speak backwards and forwards because one of the things that we have failed to do and, and I confess I did not do as well as I should have or as consistently as I should have um, we'll read some more scriptures later about how we are to view our leaders but right here we are subject we are to submit the, the word is hupotasso it means to willingly put yourself under it's a military term Here's the general, and you are choosing to place yourself underneath the general. Okay? You are choosing to be subject to his rule. Not because he is somebody that you necessarily agree with, but because the one that put him there knows what he's doing. <gasps> God knew what he was doing when he put Trump in office? Every bit as much as he did when he put Obama in office. God knows what he's doing. And when Obama came to office, I made a... Actually, I didn't make a covenant with God. I understood a responsibility that I had, and that was to pray for the president. And, and I confess, there were times when President Obama did some things that I just really did not like, and I found it very difficult to pray for him. But... God's directives are not based on how we feel. God's directives are based on what He knows to be best. He designed it. He knows how it should work. He wants it to work the way that works best. Okay? I don't understand God's purposes. I don't understand why God chose any of the presidents that He did other than it suits His purposes. Okay? So, if you do not subject yourself. See, uh, chapter 13, verse 1 says, For there is no authority except from God. And those that exist have been instituted by God. So who chose President Obama to be president? Who chose President-elect Trump to be president? Can we trust God? Amen. 
See, the, the thing that, that disturbs me um, is the anger and the hostility. And, and people without God, I can, I can see a little bit why people without God would have such hostility from one political worldview to the other political worldview. I can, I can sense that and I can, I can see that. But when people inside the church exhibit those same hostilities toward one another in church, I am completely at a loss. I am completely at a loss. The, the phrase, cutting off your nose to spite your face, comes to mind. That, see, we, we are called to be beyond this, above this. And, and how we are above this is conveyed in how we act. <clears throat> Let's read a little bit further. For rulers, verse 3, are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. <clears throat> Would you have no fear of the one who is in authority? Then do what is good and you will receive his approval. For he is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid. For he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is the servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. Therefore, one must be in subjection not only to avoid God's wrath, but also for the sake of conscience. For because of this you also pay taxes, for the authorities are ministers of God attending to this very thing. Pay to all what is owed to them, taxes to whom taxes are owed, revenue to whom revenue is owed, respect to whom respect is owed, honor to whom honor is owed. Um, I think Paul sets it very plainly before us. And before you get into this, you know, Paul didn't have to deal with uh, Trump or Paul didn't have to deal Obama depending on your stance um, this was written at the earliest when Claudius was emperor of Rome and possibly when Nero was, was, was the Caesar did I say president he's not the president he was Caesar Claudius would have been Caesar of Rome Claudius was the one that first expelled the Jews and the Christians out of the capital. Nero is the author of what we call the, the first persecution of the church. And so either time, whether it was the latter part of Claudius' reign or the earlier part of Nero's reign, things were not going well for Christians. So he's not talking about a benevolent ruler, say of the, the stripe of David, who, who had it in his heart to be God's steward and God's servant on behalf of the people. He had a, a ruler who rejected that there was one God and that that one God had made a way for him to be saved. So let's read a little bit forward. Don't turn here. I'm just going to hit a couple of verses real quick. Um, Titus chapter 3, verse 1. Remind them to be submissive to rulers and authorities to be obedient, to be ready for every good work, to speak evil of no one, to avoid quarreling, to be gentle and to show perfect courtesy toward all people. Okay? To submit yourselves to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for every good work, to speak evil of no one, to avoid quarreling. This is one thing that uh, I, I have been absolutely amazed at how many brothers and sisters in Christ have engaged in quarreling and spoken with evil intent about the authorities that God has placed over them. Now, I, I can disagree with someone's policies and not speak evil of them. We all should be able to do that, right? Isn't that the goal? Yeah. Now, just so you know, this was written under Nero uh, when the, the first great persecution was taking place. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 13. Be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme 
or to governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. For this is the will of God, that by doing good you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God. Honor everyone. Love the brotherhood. Fear God. Honor the emperor. Now, scholars are not really sure when Peter actually wrote this, but the two time frames fall under either the latter part of Nero's reign or Domitian, who, if you remember, Domitian was the author of the second great persecution of the church. Okay? Uh, Nero would wrap Christians in oil cloths and then hang them and light them on fire to light the way down the road at night. Not a good fellow. Domitian was the one that took their children, wrapped them in lambskins, and put them in the Colosseum for the dogs and the lions to eat. Not a good guy. And yet, here we have two men of God seeing, knowing what's going on, having lived through or living through what is happening, and yet still they are saying, <laughs> submit, show honor, do good, do not slander. <clears throat> so we have a clear directive from God as to how we are to treat with those who are put in authority over us. Um, why? Well, let's let's take a look. Um, Daniel. The book of Daniel gives us numerous reasons and, and actually under several different leaders. Um, so Daniel chapter 2, starting in verse 20. Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, to whom belongs wisdom and might. He changes times and seasons. He removes kings and sets up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. He reveals deep and hidden things. He knows what is in the darkness, and the light dwells with him. Did you catch what that said? He removes kings and sets up kings. Uh, down in uh, verse 37, he's speaking to Nebuchadnezzar. He says, You, O king, the king of kings, to whom the God of heaven has given the kingdom, the power and the might and the glory. So, so Daniel is speaking to Nebuchadnezzar. And he's calling him the king of kings, although little k, not big k. <clears throat> but he has the audacity to say something to Nebuchadnezzar, who has the power and the might and the glory. Hey, Nebi, buddy, where do you think you got this? It comes from God who established. Then we go down a little bit further. And if you remember, uh, actually turn with me if you would. We're going to go to Daniel chapter, I believe it's 4. Okay, now this, I'm, I'm going to read most of the chapter, okay? And keep in mind, this is the book of Daniel. But what is taking place is from the perspective of King Nebuchadnezzar. Okay? So starting in verse 4. I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at ease in my house and prospering in my palace. He's chilling. Things are going good. He's kicked back in front of his 92-inch live screen TV. And he said, I saw a dream that made me afraid. As I lay in bed, the fancies and the visions of my head alarmed me. So I made a decree that all the wise men of Babylon should be brought before me and that they might make known to me the interpretation of the dream. 
when you're a king, you get to do stuff like that. <coughs> then the magicians, the enchanters, the Chaldeans, and the astrologers came in, and I told them the dream, but they could not make known to me its interpretation. At last, Daniel came in before me, he who was named Belteshazzar, after the name of my God, and in whom the spirit of the holy gods, and I told him, I'm sorry, and in whom is the spirit of the holy gods. And I told him the dream, saying, O Belteshazzar, chief of the magicians, because I know that the spirit of the holy gods is in you, and that no mystery is too difficult for you, tell me the visions of my dream that I saw and their interpretation. The visions of my head as I lay in bed were these. I saw, and behold, a tree in the midst of the earth, and its height was great. And the tree grew and became strong, and its top reached to heaven, and it was visible to the ends of the whole earth. Its leaves were beautiful and its fruit abundant, and in it was food for all. The beasts of the field found shade under it, and the birds of the heavens lined in its, lived in its branches, and all flesh was fed from it. I saw in the vision of my head, as I lay in bed, and behold, a watcher, a holy one, came down from heaven. He proclaimed aloud and said thus, Chop down the tree and lop off its branches, strip off its leaves and scatter up its fruit. Let the beasts flee from under it and the birds from its branches. But leave the stump of its roots in the earth, bound with the band of iron and bronze amid the tender grass of the field. Let him be wet with the dew of heavens. Let his portion be with the beasts of the grass of the earth. Let his mind be changed from a man's and let a beast's mind be given to him, and let seven periods of time pass over him. The sentence is by the decree of the watchers, the decision by the word of the holy ones, to the end that the living may know that the Most High rules the kingdom of men and gives it to whom he will and sets over it the lowliest of men. This dream I, King Nebuchadnezzar, saw, and you, O Belteshazzar, tell me the interpretation because all the wise men of my kingdom are not able to make known to me the interpretation, but you are able, for the spirit of the holy gods is in you. <clears throat> now, you know, if, if I were to have this dream, it probably wouldn't bother me a whole lot, because it was not intended for me and the interpretation was not given to me. I'd wake up and go, man, i got to quit eating so close to bed. <laughs> okay? But obviously there was something in here that was prompting and was, was pushing Nebuchadnezzar because it stirred up something within him. Okay? Verse 19, Then Daniel, who was named was Belteshazzar, was dismayed for a while, and his thoughts alarmed him. The king answered and said, Belteshazzar, let not the dream or the interpretation alarm you. Belteshazzar answered and said, My lord, may the dream be for those who hate you and its interpretation for your enemies. The tree you saw, which grew and became strong, so that its top reached the heavens, and it was visible to the whole, to the end of the whole earth, whose leaves were beautiful and its fruit was abundant, and in which was food for all, under which beasts of the field found shade, and in whose branches the birds of the air or the birds of the heaven lived. It is you, O king, who have grown and become strong. Your greatness has grown and reaches to heaven, and your dominion to the ends of the earth. And because the king saw a watcher, a holy one, coming down from heaven and saying, Chop down the tree and destroy it, but leave the stump of its roots in the earth, bound with a band of iron and bronze, in the tender grass of the field, and let him be wet with the dew of heaven, and let his portion be with the beasts of the field, till seven periods of time pass over him. This is the interpretation. you got to wonder if he was just checking all this to make sure he got it right. Because he just repeated back to him everything he said. I think Daniel is setting up, hey, look, this is your dream. Uh, uh, this is not me. This is your dream. This is what the Holy One has given you. So here's the interpretation. <laughs> this is the interpretation, O King. It is a decree of the Most High, which has come upon my Lord the King, that you shall be driven from among men, and your dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field. You shall be made to eat grass like an ox, and you shall be wet with the dew of heaven. And seven periods of time shall pass over you, till you know that the Most High rules the kingdom of men, and gives it to whom he will. 
And as it was commanded to leave the stump of the roots of the tree, your kingdom shall be confirmed for you from the time that you know that heaven rules. Therefore, O king, let my counsel be acceptable to you. Break off your sins by practicing righteousness and your, your iniquities by showing mercy to the oppressed, that there may be perhaps a lengthening of your prosperity. I love Daniel. <clears throat> Daniel is one of my favorite characters of the, of the Bible <clears throat> because God put him in tough place after tough place after tough place. I mean, you look, uh, Daniel was brought as a young man out of, of Israel, out of Judah, into exile, and, and he was put into the hands of, of those who despised his people, and yet, yet he grew up in favor both with God and with man, and I think it was his favor of God that gave him favor to man, and, and it seemed like God required Daniel to live a life of faith. Okay, Daniel, here's your first test. Trust me, I'm going to give you the answer. Okay, God, God gave him the answer, and then, then God gives him another, another, and another, and another, and yet, because Daniel's faith in God was such, God had provided the answer each time, provided its solution each time, and, and he gets to the end of the interpretation, and then he says, Here's what I would tell you. Okay. Now, if he gave him the interpretation, he could say, see ya, and head back for home. But that's not what he does because Daniel's heart, I believe, was for the king. I believe that God implemented, instituted in Daniel a right relationship, a, a right understanding of the relationship between him and the king. Okay. I believe Daniel's heart was for the for goodwill for the king under God. Okay? Okay? And, and so he gives him counsel and he says, quit doing what you're doing. Quit sinning and start performing deeds of righteousness. Show mercy. Quit oppressing people. Show mercy. In the hopes that this, this prophetic dream, the outcome of that would be put off from you for a while. But what happens? Does Nebuchadnezzar listen? Well, of course not. He's human. He's just like us. He's stupid. Okay? He says, uh, verse 28, All this came upon King Nebuchadnezzar. At the end of twelve months, he was walking on the roof of the royal palace of Babylon. And the king answered and said, Is not this great Babylon, which I have built by my mighty power, as a royal residence and for the glory of my majesty? Well, look what I did. Ain't I great? While the words were still on the king's mouth, there fell a voice from heaven. Now you think the dream shook him up? <laughs> o King Nebuchadnezzar, to you it is spoken. The kingdom has departed from you, and you shall be driven from among men, and your dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field, and you shall be made to eat grass like an ox, and seven periods of time shall pass over you until you know that the Most High rules the kingdom of men and gives it to whom he will. Immediately the word was fulfilled against Nebuchadnezzar. He was driven from among men and ate grass like an ox. And his body was wet with the dew of heaven till his hair grew as long as eagle's feathers and his nails were like bird's claws. Okay. So... Twelve months has gone by. He had a dream. It shook him up. He called everybody in. Well, yeah, I don't know. Man, I'm, I'm doing good to tell you what month it is. I don't know what your dream means. Well, bring Daniel in. Daniel brings it in and says, King, hey, here's the interpretation of your dream. Now, you notice he didn't call anybody else after this. So, obviously, Nebuchadnezzar was content, was satisfied with Daniel's interpretation of the dream. Now, a year goes by, twelve months goes by, and obviously he hasn't stopped doing what he's been doing. And he has the arrogance to stand on the royal palace, the roof of the royal palace, look around and say, look what I've done. Okay? Whenever kings do this, it's bad. It's not good. Do you guys remember Herod in the New Testament when he started getting cocky? What happened to him? Worms. Worms. They nibbled him away. But look at what happens here. At the end of the days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted my eyes to heaven, and my reason returned to me, and I blessed the Most High and praised 
and honored him who lives forever. For his dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing, and he does according to his will among the host of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. And none can stay his hand or say to him, What have you done? At the same time, my reason returned to me, and for the glory of my kingdom, my majesty and splendor returned to me. My counselors and my Lord sought me, and I was established in my kingdom, and still more greatness was added to me. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the King of heaven, for all his works are right, and his ways are just, and those who walk in pride he is able to humble. Now, this, this message would probably perhaps be best given to Donald Trump for what's coming up. Amen? Amen. Amen. Because he can't afford to be arrogant. Okay? Because no matter how the voting went, how the electorals will, will poll in December, no matter how the, the people polled last Tuesday, God has placed him where he is for God's purposes. I, I don't know what God's purposes are. I don't claim to know what his purposes are. I know what the end picture looks like and somehow or another we got to get from where we are to there. Okay? And I don't think it's going to be pretty. Let me rephrase that. The conditions are not going to be pretty but it's going to make for a beautiful bride. Okay? So... God establishes those who are in authority over us. God appoints them for His good pleasure. We are called to submit ourselves to them. We are called to honor them. We are called not to speak scandalously about them. And that includes posting memes on Facebook, doing things like that, you know, whether it be our existing president or the one to come, because I, I've actually had some intense conversations with brothers that in one moment will post something encouraging and blessing of God and Christians, and in the next breath will slam the president. And I, I, I remind them that James reminds us that fresh water doesn't flow from a salt spring, neither does salt water flow from a fresh water spring. They can't be together. You can't keep mixing your messages. Okay? So, what I want to say to you this morning, trust God. Get your trust out of your elephant. Get your trust out of your donkey. Get your trust out... What is the symbol for the independence? I don't even know. I... An eye? <laughs> That's kind of creepy. Get your trust where it belongs with the one who will never fail it. Put your trust in God. Okay? His plans and His purposes are always for our good in the long run. It may be a hardship, it may be a burden now, but in the long run it's going to produce a, a, a fruit. It's going to produce a faith that is better than pure gold. And pray, pray, pray for your leaders. Pray for your president. Pray for the president-elect. Pray for those that are in Washington right now. Pray for those that are coming to Washington. Pray for those that are in charge of our state. Pray for those that are in charge of our, our city. Pray for those that are in charge of our county. Pray for them that they might be men that God would use for His good, His plans, His purposes. You can't go wrong because that's what He says He's doing. Right? Right? Let's pray. Father, we bless you today and we thank you because you are in charge of everything. I thank you, God, that I don't have to understand why you do what you do. But I can see in your word that you are trustworthy. That I can place my faith in you and it will never fall short. It will never diminish. It will never fail because you never fail. And I ask, Lord God, that you would strengthen us today, 
that we might be a people that would live according to how you desire. That Father, as uh, President Obama wraps up his tenure in the White House, we pray a blessing over him and his family, over his government. We pray, Father, that it would end well. We ask, Lord God, that you would take hold of him and use him for your purposes even after he leaves. We pray, Father, for uh, President-elect Trump and those that he is bringing into office. And we pray, Father, that he would be a godly man, that you would use him to accomplish your purposes, and that, Father, he would work willingly with what you would choose to do. And we pray, Father, for the rest of the leaders that have been elected and will be coming in. Father, for the, the senators, the representatives, those that are local in our state, the governor, Bullock. We pray, Father, that you would give him your wisdom. We pray, Father, for our representatives in our state, in our county, in our city. And we ask, Lord God, that you would lead them, that they would lead, that they would rule in righteousness. And that, Father, we would be a people that would be eager to serve. That nothing evil could be said about us by the way we live our lives. And we honor you because above all of this, holding all of this together with complete surety is you. We bless you and we honor you today. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.